So the title of uh, what I'm going to share today is shame. Okay, S H A M E. And yeah, I can see Jyoti kind of thinking possibly what on earth, why on earth are we going to be discussing this, huh? Or talking about it during a sub, uh, during the message in church? That's private. So uh, to start with, why? this subject. Huh? I received an invitation, Anila had sent it, about a three evening course on dealing with our emotions and the title was Emotions, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. So, we all know emotions are feelings, yeah, Ex um, which we experience in response to or as a reaction to some situation. Hmm? And it's exp they are expressed by some behavior. So one, a key learning for me was that all emotions are good. They are given by God. And they are created in us to help us to relate to people and to deal with situations in a godly manner. Another learning for me was that very often, emotions, we suppress our emotions, you know. We just say, no, we negate them or we dismiss them. And we have a distorted understanding of our emotions, possibly because of things we have heard in childhood, society's approach to some emotions, our fam families, you know, how they see situations and what they feel we should think. So what happens is that emotions are not identified correctly or they are not appropriately dealt with and so that can make life very difficult and even ugly and you know an opportunity is given for demons to really work over time as we struggle with emotions that are suppressed, which are distorted, which we don't understand ourselves. We came away, however, from that session encouraged that Jesus is our, of course, Jesus our saviour is our healer and teacher. Of course we know it. But I came away saying Jesus can heal all past emotional damage and that the Holy Spirit can reveal what needs changing in me? What's happening in me? And the Holy Spirit can help us change. The other thing we learnt was to talk to Jesus. There's some song by Maverick City, which I love talking to Jesus. Just talk to Jesus. Talk to him about things that we don't typically talk about. We ask for healing for, you know, physical ailments, for finances, for work problems, for relational problems. But talk to him about our feelings, the things that are disturbing us, distressing us, yeah, discouraging us, something that we feel is disgracing us. And then, just as we talk, just come to him and ask for forgiveness. Just forgive whoever may be responsible and repent and be healed. So that course was about anger and disappointment and envy and grief. I struggled with all of those too. So that was very good for me. Now, a few days after that, I'm given, I'm invited to another session on practical healing by a totally different group of people. And here I have to confess, it was really, it seemed very weird. Yeah, because we are in this room of total strangers and we are asked to pray in tongues, aloud. Then, cut, we are in breakout rooms with complete strangers. And we are asked to share our disappointments, if any, with this group. And that we will pray for each other. St strangely, but not so strange. I found myself... Just for the first time ever, just sharing 
things that had happened in my childhood, childhood traumas, which I felt had adversely influenced the way I react to people and situations and had changed the direction of my life for the worse. Okay, so we prayed for each other. Nothing happened, okay. Nothing much changed. I was still paralyzed with regard to this all-important message. But, you know, <laughs> there's more, sorry, there's more. The night of this train session, I get a random, somebody sends a random reference to a verse, uh, uh, to Isaiah 54 on a group chat. Years ago, this chapter had really spoken to me very powerfully. And then I forgot. I'd held on to it. I forgot. I couldn't remember where it was in the Bible. I didn't forgot it was in Isaiah. I forgot, of course, the number of the chapter. But I just felt impelled to read it and to look at it again. And then in another situation, two days later, in another group, somebody just spoke Isaiah 54 verse 4. Now this is the verse. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You know, that word shame just leapt out at me. And this verse was, it was like God's Rima word. It was, it was revelation. It was an assurance. It was an encouragement and a declaration of deliverance from shame and its memory. You know, it was God's promise to me. And you, yeah, I just felt so excited, you know. It was like, yay, God. You know, I understood for the first time that God understood my shame and the anatomy of shame, what shame is, and the trauma and torment of it. I also experienced through the verse the tenderness of God coming into my shame situation. And so, I just wanted to know more about what shame is, what shame does, why it still haunted me when I, you know, I believed in Jesus and how God delivers from shame. And then another question in my mind was, God, had you ever experienced shame firsthand? So, what is shame? We have dictionary definitions. It's a painful feeling caused by the consciousness or exposure of unworthy or indecent conduct or circumstances. Or it's an uncomfortable feeling of guilt or feeling ashamed because of your own or someone's bad behavior. It's caused by the belief that one is or one is perceived to be inferior or unworthy of affection or respect because of one's own actions, thoughts, circumstances and experiences. I'm not even going into what psychiatry says. Yeah. So, that, this, you know, the power of shame, you know, all the words we heard are painful, but that is what shame is. It's a deeply painful, disturbing feeling. And those who live with the shame feeling believe that there is something terribly wrong with them. No what, matter what anybody says. Something so wrong that it can't even be spoken about. The very acknowledgement of that shame feeling just revulses us, repulses us. It causes such self-hatred and such self-report. Because shame tells me I am bad. Not just that I have done something bad. The other thing about shame is, of course, it has its roots 
very often in the distant past when we were unable to process what we experienced or even what we did. Uh, sexual abuse, misuse, but so many other things are reasons for seeding us with shame. Sometimes shame can also rise from circumstances that are beyond our control. Nobody has done any, no human being has any, done anything to us. We have not done anything. The third thing is, shame is very difficult to get free from. In World War II, I think they had limpet minds that came and attached themselves to people. And that's what shame is. It comes and attaches itself to you and it's so hard to shake off. Even when we've asked forgiveness of God, you know, when we came to him and many times after, Shame gives rise to a sense of unworthiness and deep insecurity. Yeah, we feel flawed. And it makes us, and that is so important, what, I mean, you know, we need to know that what shame does is, it makes us feel that we are not lovable. And that we cannot love wholeheartedly. It comes in the way of loving freely, spontaneously, genuinely, wholeheartedly. And very often it just it causes us to blame others and shame them in an attempt to feel we are in control. Shame makes us want to run away and hide from God and others. We all know the Adam and Eve story. After they sinned, they hid. And then they covered themselves up. When the Bible says in the previous chapter, the man and wife were naked and felt no shame. You know, another thing is shame prevents us from taking risks and exploring our God-given creative potential for fear of being, making mistakes and being ridiculed. Shame makes it very difficult to expose our real selves, to open up, to talk about our struggles with those we are really close to, or seek professional help, or even share it, you know, with godly mentors for fear of being labeled, criticized, despised, rejected. And the inner dialogue is often, if people knew the kind of person I am, the things I have done, the thoughts I think, that which I continue to do, what would they think of me? They would want nothing to do with me. And so shame with just one broad stroke just denies all that God values in us and that people value in us. It negates everything that God has given in us. It tars us black in all our ways. And I believe Shame is one of the most powerful weapons the devil has to keep us from embracing God's plans for us. And even, you know, when you stop and think of the vocabulary or the phraseology that society uses and the church uses and we may have used or other people have, may have used, you know, when we were young, uh, is whether it is low grades, whether it is rude behavior or more serious stuff, very often, we hear lines like, you should be ashamed of yourself. Or, if you're talking of somebody else, completely shameful what they did. Huh? Or, you bring shame on us all. Or worse still, we are ashamed of you. See, the intention may have been to correct, but it really wounds the shamed soul. And also, you know, even the destructiveness of shame is in our vocabulary. You know, we say, I said it when we started, I was, in some context, I was overwhelmed by shame. You know, I could have died of shame. Or it was to their everlasting shame. So, in that context, is there hope then? 
Thanks be to God for every instance recorded in the Bible of God embracing the shamed and the shameful and leading them into new life. We know, we are familiar with the Samaritan woman who had five failed marriages and now a lover who comes to the well when? At noonday. Why? To hide from the sneers and the jeers of and the veiled comments of other women. Or the woman, we know the story of the woman who was desperate for healing. She knew Jesus could heal and would heal. But how did she approach him? Creeping possibly on her knees from behind, just touching the hem of his garment. We know of King David, who tried to cover up his adultery, his pregnant lover, by trying to get poor Uriah in and to sleep with his wife and that didn't happen and so to cover up shame upon shame he ended up organizing Uriah, his murder. So while there was shame we know that each of these people experienced God's power to break shame's hold over them and set them free. You know uh, there's a line in a psalm, I think, which says, God is truly the lifter up. He is the lifter up of our heads. And why is he the lifter up of our heads? Because our heads are bowed down and low with shame. And so we see Jesus going to unlikely places, to those whose society considered shameful, drunkards, Roman stooges, prostitutes, the woman caught in adultery, trapped by her sin, so many. We see Jesus going to lonely places and meeting where lepers cover at the sight of people. You know, Jesus doesn't necessarily wait for us to find him. He searches us out in our hiding places and calls us. Out, saying, come out, your sins are forgiven, sin no more. So, of course, most of us have, have experienced shame at some time of our lives or the other. Some of us may know that we are still trapped in this web of shame. And we are struggling to extricate ourselves, but maybe just fail and don't know how. Others of us may not even be aware that we are captives of shame. But yet we find ourselves wondering why it's difficult to have an authentic relationship with God or other people. Why we can't love God passionately or why we really don't love just praying, not praying for things but just engaging with God. Or why we don't really care to engage in his word, which is his love and his presence. Why we don't experience the fullness of joy that the Bible talks about, that is promised us. Why we continue to live in doubt of our capabilities. Why we fear people more than God. So one thing to remember, yeah. God is, the, is great and he is greater and he is the greatest. But Satan is the father of lies. And so he is bombarding us with our worthlessness, our failure, our guilt, our real and perceived sins, forgiven though they are. He even blinds us from recognizing this painful, painful shame that we experience. He prevents us from naming what we are experiencing. And so we believe this lie that we are guilty that we are deficient, that we are defective. And often we are too proud or overwhelmed with shame to admit our innermost feelings, you know, and our weaknesses and our failures to stay to Jesus. And so we stay ensnared, we stay trapped. 
when Jesus has already set us free. And since our pride and our ignorance and our confusion encourage us to hide our shame in the wrong places, we don't give ourselves the opportunity to confront it and take it to Jesus. So we all know we hide in busyness or procrastination. We hide behind our devices and our gadgets and social media. We hide in outright lies or just chat. We hide in our bravado, our timidity. We hide in doing good. The point is, how can the power of shame be broken in our lives? You know, God gave me a picture of shame as I was reflecting on this. A picture of the naked Jesus on the cross. The King of Heaven, the Son of God, stripped naked in every way of his divinity, of his dignity, despised, degraded, rejected, his wretchedness exposed. He allowed himself to be shamed for my sake and yours. There's that account at the end of Noah when, you know, he's discovered naked, but two of his sons, they walk backward with a garment over their shoulders and they lay it over their father's nakedness. Jesus tenderly covers our nakedness when we whisper our shame to him and everything leading up to it and everything it led us to do and become. You know, he takes off those tattered garments of shame which we so desperately try to hide ourselves in. And he gives us his garments of righteousness. He covers our shame. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. And what was that joy? The joy that was set before him was the joy of freeing us from bondage and restoring us to his father. The joy of being obedient to his father too. So that we are free to live holy for him, unashamed to be called his disciples, unashamed to speak his truth, willing and eager to be shamed for his sake. So, Jesus calls us out of our hiding, out of our captivity and invites us to come to him today with our burden of shame. He is our hiding place and we have no other refuge. So, believe Jesus died for you. Believe that when he died for you, he took your shame, not just your guilt, your shame and the pain of your shame and all your sins on the cross. Ask the Holy Spirit. So, let's have a time of silence now. Yeah, we can close our eyes. Just spend some time with the Holy Spirit. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help you recognize your shame, name your shame and trust Jesus to deliver you from it. However old that shame is, however deep-rooted the shame is, however horrendous it is, Jesus does a deep work of cleansing in us.
Holy Spirit. We ask you to reveal our shame to us. You take us to that time in your life, in our lives, where we were shamed or did something that made you ashamed. Holy Spirit, show us our attempts to cover up our shame in wrong places. Show us the hiding places we run to. We believe you want to deliver us, Lord, from shame today. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let the Son of God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. He will take all your years of shame and pain away from you. He will make you whole. Just trust God's promises for you. Believe they are for you. Hold on to them. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <coughs> if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Lord God, your promise to us is no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. You will abound in every good work. You are no longer a slave to fear and shame and the pain of shame. You have received the spirit of sonship. We are God's children. Receive God's promise for you. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. Come Holy Spirit, do your work, your beautiful work of cleansing and delivering us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Just say more of you, Holy Spirit. you who cut the shackles it is you who detach us or detach shame from us 
it is you who sever the cords of shame that have kept us captive all these years. We praise you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your awesome work. We thank you for your healing streams. Thank you for setting us free.